Uh, what's going on, everybody? We're here. We're not actually live for one of the first times in a while. My name is Joey Ingram, a.k.a. Chicago Joey. Welcome to Poker Life Podcast. Uh, before we get into today's podcast, my iTunes is officially updated for all the people that send me messages begging me to update iTunes. Search Poker Life. Also, my prop bet for my music video, 100,000 views. Uh, it's going pretty strong. I think we're almost to 55,000. If you haven't watched it yet, go watch it right now. Please comment. It's going to be a great summer. And uh, that's it, man. Joining me today on the podcast is a man who has won the World Series of Poker main event, which is one of the most epic things you can possibly do in your entire poker career. Back in, I believe it was, was it 2004, 2005, Joe? What, what was the year for this, that for you won the main event? 2005. Man. 2005. All right, 2005. And a man who is, I, I think, probably one of the biggest ambassadors of poker in Australia. Anytime I think of Australian poker, this is the man that I think about. A guy who's still going strong in the poker world and also a man who loves the great game. I think he loves the great game of Patlam Omaha. I know he likes to play the great game. We're going to find out if he actually loves the great game, too. From doing a little Instagram deep dive he uh, allegedly bought a car off of Potlum in Omaha. So listen, I think he's got to love uh, Potlum in Omaha if he bought a car off Potlum in Omaha. We're joined by the man, Joe Hashem. What's up, Joe? Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you, Joey. Appreciate it. So uh, so you you play a lot of PLO. This was something I wasn't sure exactly if you were mainly play tournaments and then also play some no-home cash games. But you So you play a lot of Potlum in Omaha cash games over in Australia? Yeah, we um, the last six or seven years we've had the luxury of having a really good game here. Um, intermittent, depending on when this guy comes into town. There's really no no big action um, in Australia outside of this game. Uh, so we just sit around and wait. I think he's coming in this week again So to, to light the party up. So wait, you wait for one guy to come to town? Is it that, like, what kind of, what kind of state game are we playing? Um, it's... It, in the first couple of days, it'll start off as uh, one one one. Within uh, three days or two days, it'll be at like one two four, one two four eight, some something stupid like that. Like, depending on how how excited he is and how much he wants to play. So, well, that that sounds, um, that sounds like a yeah. uh, a good guy to have in the game. So he did, he comes to yeah. town. It starts as one one one, and then as the action ramps up, it starts moving up progressively. And what happens when he leaves? Do you go back and have a different regular game you play, or what other games are you playing on the regular? Unfortunately, um, the depth of uh, high stakes poker out here isn't so great. Mm -hmm. So, um, five ten is the game outside of this. So it's <laughs> it's like five ten or <laughs> one two four eight. Like it's, you know, um, so really when he's not in town or there's a couple of them but when he when those guys aren't in town uh for games or there's no series on where outsiders come mm -hmm. there's really no game not not for me to play anyway so i, I do other stuff in that meantime so how, how do you find the balance between hopping in a very high stakes game and then going back and, and playing some lower stakes 510 because i know a lot of poker players i know that they couldn't do that. I don't know. For they, 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 they'd go crazy trying to, especially if they had a big, lo big losing session in the higher stake game. Even if they sold action or whatever, they'd still have a very hard time dropping down and taking any stakes that are that much lower. Very serious. The answer is easy, Joey. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't do it because I. Every time I step into that game, I just bleed money. Like you know, it's just you can't. It's very hard. Um, and I've kind of had many prop bets in my life about. If you ever see me in a red chip game, which is a $5 uh, game, if you ever see me in a red chip game, I'll give you $500 straight away. <laughs> so just just to stop myself from getting involved in those stupid games. Not, yeah. not that they're stupid, but it's stupid for me to try and get back into a game like that, like you said, especially after you, if you've been playing for a week or two weeks at the other stakes. Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to grind out $1,000. It's just, It's just too dumb. For yeah. me anyway. I, no, I'm not disciplined enough to do it. No, yeah, I mean I, I agree. I think that if if two five or if one one or five ten is your regular game, I think that's you know, that, that makes sense. But when your game's such a higher stake and you're you're going through those emotional swings that that, that happen at the high stakes and mm. I mean it, it's it's really hard to sort of I don't, I don't know people, I know some people do it out there, not many people do it out there, but I, I'm not quite sure how they can go back down, even if no. Yeah, no matter what the case, even if they're completely backed, I, I don't know how they could possibly go back down and then play like a lower stake game and ever take it that serious. 
I, I just, I, I don't know. It'd be I, tough. I've only ever known one person, one professional poker player who's who's an absolute legend. It's uh, Jeff Lissandro. Mm. He can play in a 2-5 game and he can play in a 4,000, 8,000 game the same. I don't understand how he does it, but good luck to him. He can do it. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. So outside of uh, outside of this game running, what else do you do you spend your time on? How much poker are you playing out there? Unfortunately, not as much as I'd like to. Unfortunately, there's, uh, outside of if there's not a series on here, there's there's not really much poker for me to play. And there's mm-hmm. not, I don't have the luxury that that you guys have in in the, in the US where you can play in private home games with people, you know, who've got money to play. The our biggest uh, disadvantage down here is. The culture in Australia is not about poker; it's about horse racing. Mm. So, uh, all the white collar people and the business guys who are loaded are happy to lose fifty thousand a weekend gambling on the horses. But if they lost five hundred dollars playing poker, they'd lose their mind. It's it's quite weird. Now, whereas in your country, um, all everyone who's got money wants to play poker. You know, there's, it's like, yeah, let's have a poker game. Let's, mm. let's play and let's let's start the stakes at 25, 50 and work our way up from there. Whereas here, it's impossible. It's actually impossible. Yeah, I find that interesting because I, I know um, I, I posted a video on my Instagram and on my Twitter of a couple comments that you made a few years back. I think it was about 2014. And I remember watching that video at the time. And, and in that video, you talk about how poker's dying and you talk about someone who is very, very good with recreational poker players named Antonio Sfandiari, who... Yeah, I believe he is very, very good with recreational poker players, and he is great at, ha- at having his games. He has different games. He plays in games here. Mm-hmm. I think he plays in games maybe in California. He's also yeah. playing on live at the bike in some of these games. He's playing on poker after dark. He's someone that I feel like has done an amazing job at. I mean, doesn't really ever play public games. He just plays on the on these private games, sort of thing like that. And and it's kind of amazing that you can set that up here in America. I, I would think that you could have something like that in Australia, but. It's pretty wild to think that outside of a, a few weeks, you can't really get a consistent game. No, yeah, it's it's actually, it's really sad because um, someone with my profile, if I was in America, I'd be able to get into a home game every week. For no sure. No problem, right? Mm-hmm. Um, here, it doesn't exist. The the home games here are like 1-2 or 5-5. Five, five. I mean, and there's the, the guy, the, the like I said, the unfortunate thing is the people who have the money, who would normally be playing home games uh, back in the US? They would never even st- they'd play a sit and go for like a hundred bucks and go, wow, that was a big night. Like that's um, that's how absurd it is. You know? So I've got to come to to the states on a regular basis to get my fix. Basically, that's uh, that's the answer. Well, as someone who's uh, taken that that nice flight more than one time, I, I don't. That's not a very fun flight to come from America to, from to Australia. How often are you are you coming out here? How often are you going to Europe or, or someplace like that to be able to play some live poker? So, um, I generally visit the states three or four times a year, and Europe I haven't gone for a long time because it's just too far. Mm-hmm. I mean, Europe is double the time that it takes me to get to the states. Just about. Um, Macau was good for a while. Um, I still attend the Poker Stars uh, ACOP event. Um, I might do that once or twice a year. But the live cash games in Macau, again, it's either five, ten, or two thousand, four thousand. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and the really, really good games in Macau and Hong Kong, I can't get into. They're all, you know, strictly private. Mm. I can't get a seat for them. So, yeah, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go play. Uh, 4,000, 8,000, 10,000, 20,000. Uh, Nella would hold them with the, the sickos that play in the Philippines. And that's not my thing. So, it's, I, I guess I would imagine you you probably miss playing because it, it seems like everything that I take away from you, it seems like you, you really love poker. You love the game of poker. You you pride yourself on being an ambassador of poker, someone who, who spreads the game around and encourages other people to play. And it kind of sounds like just from you saying that, that you. You wish things were different, like you wish you had the opportunity to play more poker, but your home is in Australia, and you try to make the best of what you have, what you have right now. One hundred percent. I wish there was more poker to play, but it is what it is. Look, I um, when I was with Poker Stars and for a few years afterwards, I spent a lot of time on the road in those years. I was I was living out of a suitcase basically for seven years, eight years. Wow. So I, you know, I did the whole 
the whole mileage thing and and travelled everywhere and whatever. So at this time in my life, you know, my kids are an age now where um, they're finding their path in life as adults. I think it's it works out well that I'm here for them um, more often. And uh, we've got a number of businesses in Australia too that I kind of oversee. Not that I am hands-on, but I oversee them, so I'm here for my kids. My daughter got married a couple of years ago. My son's engaged now to be married next year. So it's a, it's a really good time in my family life, which I, I appreciate. Um, and that'll be, you know, like a bell-shaped curve eventually. And we'll, the kids will get married and move out and whatever and have their life. And then uh, that'll probably free me up a little bit more. But then I, I don't think I'll, I'll be free because once the grandchildren arrive, I think I'm going to be locked in again. <laughs> so, but look, I, you know, all in all, Joey, I have nothing to complain about. I had such a great run. You know, um, I was lucky enough to win the World Series at the height of the poker boom. You know, like like t- today, guys that win, it's not the same. I had it. So, we had it so good. You know, for a few years there, me, Moneymaker, and Raymo, like it was. Everyone was just bright eyed and excited, and the game was growing so much and. Um, online poker was still at its infancy, basically growing. People were throwing money at at you, and uh, sad to say, but uh, being uh, the main event champion back then meant a lot more than what it does now, unfortunately. Yeah. Not to take anything away from the guys that went today. I think the guys that went today, you know, are way better players than what we were back then, one hundred percent, because. The fields were softer back then. The game has changed so much. But just the uh, perception, how you were treated, how everything, I I feel so lucky to have been part of that. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I, I kind of, I guess the main event, kind of, you know, in one of the interviews you mentioned about once, uh, once like Jerry Yang and then Jamie Gold won it. I also kind of think some of the people that that won it in maybe let's say like past 2010 were more quiet types of people. They weren't really out there. They weren't trying to be ambassadors. They basically yeah. said like, yeah, I have no interest in being an ambassador. I don't like give much of a fuck. I'm just gonna win this. That's it, and I'm gonna move on. And I, I think if that happens more than once and that keeps happening, well, then it, it, right. it might sort of dilute what exactly it means to be a champion. That's a, that's a pretty interesting point. And I, I, agree. I yeah, agree. Yeah, I haven't really yeah. heard many people, many people talk much about, I guess, if the main event champion ha- has lost its luster a little bit. But yeah, what's kind of your perception on it as a former champion? I just know, dude, like, it was the time though those few years I couldn't walk down that hallway <laughs> at the Rio. Like I really couldn't go anywhere. Like it was ridiculous. And don't forget how many times they used to play the main event on replay on ESPN. Mm-hmm. And they used to they used to televise a lot of other events. So people would see you so much. You know, like they honestly at you you're thirty three, so you, you're of the right age. I don't know whether you were at the WSP at the time, but there was there were hysterics going on, you know, for, from the poker fans. It was just retarded <laughs> what was going on, right? Like, I feel today, to your point about those guys that came after 2010, 2012, were a bit quieter and, and some openly said, like, I don't give a fuck. Right, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. And that hurt me a bit when they said that. Um, and I, I made my opinions, you know, public. Um, part of that is people like, of my vintage who won the World Series, we came into the game of poker. We grew up in poker. We loved poker. It turned into something that could you could make a lot of money out of, but the, the love is where it started. These other guys, a lot of the, the players, the young players today, come into the game because their friend told them, hey, you can make money. This is your smart guy. Let me teach you a couple of things. And so they've come into it from a financial point of view and they look at it that way only and you can see that that's that's why a lot of cash games all around the world are dying because everyone's playing for their edges you know that's mm-hmm. why online poker is struggling because the guys are too good they're, they're too professional I think what's happening to poker now is kind of what um, happened to backgammon um, 20 years ago when the program started solving all of backgammon and you see like uh, I had a conversation with someone the other day who, who said to me that um, 
heads up, no limit is almost solved. <laughs> Where are we going? You know, like, um, you, you know, you, I, I watched a couple of, uh, or listened to a couple of things that you uh, were on about, about some uh, America's card room and the bots mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. in Pot Limit Omaha, right? So, you know, poker is a social game. Poker, people, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like the future of poker online, put it that way. Well, yeah, I mean, with online poker right now, it's um, it, it's it's not quite, you know, it's just, to me, back in the day, it was a pretty straightforward thing. You had full tilt poker yeah. stars. You start at the bottom. You try to work your way up to the top, and, and that was sort of what it was. Now it's it's more of you try to avoid playing against bots. You try to avoid getting your money taken by sites. You're trying to avoid people colluding against you and hope that the, the sites have good security. You're playing on these application sites uh, that are based out of China. You're playing on sites that have a very, very high rake that, I mean, they're basic, their main goal. I've talked with some of these companies. Their main goal is to take as much money as they can out of, out of the cash games, as, and they don't necessarily care about much else. Can. Right, yeah. Like they, they, it's not like, <laughs> oh, we care about the health of this game or this or that. It's like, no, we yeah. want to make as much money as we can. And I think that's fine. Yeah, I get it. You're a business. You're allowed to do what you want to do in that situation. But it, it, it does not bode well for the future of online poker. And we have Phil Galfon, who's going to have his site run at once poker coming up here hopefully sometime soon phil hopefully it's coming phil mm-hmm. and um i mean i don't know if that's gonna be able to make an impact but yeah i, I don't think we're going down a a very good path right now it, it just kind of seems like everything's so segregated and spread out and yeah it's a, it's a little unfortunate to see exactly what's taking mm-hmm. place with all these bots and, and Popman omaha especially well it, you know it, across um online poker all across one of the things that you just met, uh, touched on before which i think is really important is I think I've never seen in the history of the game whilst I've been involved is collective powers getting together for the good of poker. They only do what's best for them, whether it be an online poker site, whether it be the WSOP, whether it be the WPT. They don't actually sit down and go, okay, what is the best way to grow this game forward? They're all going, no, we're going to be the best. We're going to grow. We're going to make the most money. Fuck everyone else. Like, it's part of the game of poker that people are self-centered and, and want, want, you know, what's in it for them. But let's think a little bit bigger. Let's, let's try and think about, let's try and get together and what can we do to grow the game as a whole? Okay, so there may be no financial benefit for me today, but if we help grow the game, at some point there will be. Right. Because there'll be more people coming to the game, you know? I know a lot of, uh, a lot of social players who gave up totally online because they just got crushed so badly. Yeah. You know, and because of all the programs and that, they, a lot of these guys who would, who would lose a hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars a week, but they were having fun. But, you know, they, they've given that up altogether because they, they have no chance anymore, you know, and they, they get bum hunted, they get whatever. What do, you, what do you think about the state of live poker? Because I guess this year we had this second big, I think it was the second biggest main event turnout ever. It seemed like out here the games were crazy. I mean, I've never seen so much Pop Omaha action in Vegas in my entire life in terms of at all stakes, at small stakes, mid stakes, and at high stakes. It seemed like cash games were booming pretty hard out here. The tournament series at the Win, the tournament series at Aria, the tournament series at Planet Hollywood seemed like they were really doing well this year. So it seems like to me, live poker, maybe during the, the main event specifically or during the World Series specifically, was booming pretty hard. What, what, do, you, what do you kind of think about uh, about live poker currently? I totally agree. I think um, live poker is booming. Um, this is the first year at WSOP that I noticed that the cash games were better than the year before. The last four or five years, I felt that it was declining. Uh, but this year, it's taken a, a nice little uh, you know, uptick um, like you said, I, there were like three or four tables of 50, 100 PLO every day. That, that was was hard to get one game up last year. <laughs> so, And as far as uh, live tournament goes, there, I have a, a bit of a theory um, because tournament poker has been strong for the last five years consistently, year yep. in, year out, all, all across from what I can tell, from uh, EPT numbers, Aussie Million numbers, um, WSOP, WPT. And a, a part of that theory that I... I think the reason is there's a few more people coming into the game, but also to the the tournament players that used to think they could play cash games as well, have decided, you know what? We're not going to play cash anymore. We're just going to play tournaments. So they're re-entering the tournaments more often rather than losing their money in the cash game. 
But for, for many years, because I started off as a cash game player, for many years you'd be sitting there at the cash game table waiting for the tournament um, <laughs> genius to, to, you know, to bink something to come and sit down at the table with you. Um, you don't see many of those tournament guys anymore. You know, if they're playing cash game, they, they usually they have an idea of what they're doing. Hmm. That's an interesting point. How how did the the reentry tournament and how did the the this reentry tournament, which is now pretty much a regular thing, it seems like amongst a lot of series out there for party poker series, uh, I believe for EPTs, I think there are reentries now too. How did that impact the cash games and did it impact for the worse or did it impact it for the better? Yeah, I don't know. That's it. I've never really thought about it. I don't play too many tournaments, so I don't really get to see exactly how what the games are like and exactly how they shifted. But I, I do recall even online, when you play online poker, you you, you want to play with the tournament guys. I, I enjoyed when the tournament guys came over there. I'm not saying they were the worst players ever, but at the same time, they usually come with a lot of confidence. They come with uh, ability to gamble it up, and they usually have some money. So, And they just tended to be making some mistakes that are pretty normal mistakes that tournament players tend to make. But Correct, correct, yeah. Yeah, I guess we don't really see the tournament player DGENs anymore. I, I mean, I'm sure they still exist out there. People are going to say, uh, yeah, we, we still see them. But I think a lot of those guys probably lost a lot of money at this point in time. They can't really afford to be that reckless or their backers or stakers are, are smarter now. So they're not letting them go play cash games after they go bust out of tournaments. So maybe that's why. I mean, there's probably a bunch of different reasons why we don't see that happen as much anymore. But do you think that makes the cash games overall better? Or, or what, do you, what do you attribute to the games maybe being better this year at the series? I have no idea what happened this year. I actually have no idea why it, it exploded in numbers in cash games this year. Um, yeah, I don't know. Because I, I looked around and um, I couldn't tell whether these guys, whether they were new, whether they were old. Obviously, with me not being on the scene um, as regular as I used to be, I show up every few months and I recognise 80% of the faces, but 20% I go, okay, who are these guys like? Mm -hmm. Are they guys that have just made a breakthrough, or they just won a tournament? Um, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. What What do you think about that? How do you, why do you think that happened? Well, it's interesting because I, when I walked into Aria this summer, and I think there was maybe four or five, five, ten, twenty games. I've never seen that many. And maybe it was six or something. Yeah. Like that. Never seen that many in my right. entire life going at Aria. And I'm looking right. at these games. I'm like. Where the hell are these people from? I'm like looking around. I mean, there's multiple, there's different races in the game. There's a lot, bunch of women in the game. I'm like, where do these people come from? Like, where, mm -hmm. where, what? This is crazy. Like, I, I don't exactly know yeah. what the you know, uptick is of Pop Manoha. Obviously, I like to think that hopefully I keep spreading the great game word out there. I call it the great game. Maybe people hear it eventually and they're like, oh fuck, I'm gonna try this game. And then once you win at Pop Manoha, I mean, that's that's a that that's a ride. When you have like some winning sessions, you're like, holy shit, this is oh my god, and and. and even if you have losing sessions, you're still going to remember those big winning sessions you have. So I like to think that. Also, there's so much solver talk at Nolan Hold'em that I think if you're a no, if you are playing Nolan Hold'em, you just hear solver, solver, solver. Eventually, you're like, all right. I mean, maybe I want to think about playing a different game. So I I, can't, I, I wish I I knew the exact reasons why it seems like it's gaining in popularity, but. Yeah, it took me back th this summer too, just seeing that. I was like, man, this is, and I don't expect it to go down anytime soon because it just seems like at these Nolan Holden games, mm -hmm. and another thing is you got a lot of these guys on their iPads all the time. You got them on their phone all the time. You got them really not saying much of a word. Whereas at PLO and the games that I played in, it's very jovial. People are talking, people are having a good time. It, it's just, it seems like a different experience at the table. And then when I look around at the Nolan Holden games, it's like, you know, you got three guys watching fucking an X-Men movie on their iPad. And it's like, I mean, come on, can we put a stop to the iPads? I, I don't, I, I mean, whatever. I don't like the iPads. I'm not a big fan of those, obviously. I don't see how they're good for the game. It, it just doesn't make much sense to me. And hopefully we'll be able to change, make a change with that in the future. And it seems like there are some things being done for cash games. Live at the Bike just added this action clock last night, 30 second, um, 30 second shot clock with five time extensions. So if something like that becomes a norm in cash games, I think we're going to see uh, it just, they end up being a little bit different, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think the shot clock is going to change that much. Mm. I think the antisocial behavior is really crippled no limit hold'em cash games. That's why I moved to PLO, to be honest. Because, mm. you know, I like to have a bit of a chat, have some fun at the table. And everyone started becoming just not fun to play with, you know, like everyone. And everyone everyone became a genius, you know, like, like you said, talking solvers and dude, can we just fucking play the game? Can we just, you know, put stick your money in the game? Stop telling me how good you are. Just put some money in the pot. Let's, 
let's run some cards, you know. Um, whereas PLO, you don't have to, you know, convince anybody to stick money in the pot. <laughs> the, the money just finds its way in the pot. Oh, that that is, I mean, that that's so true. I mean, maybe, I think maybe we're naming reasons why right now that PLO is gaining more and more. I think we're kind of, we're talking out the answer ourselves now is we're saying, okay, this, okay, that. Eventually it starts adding up to the point where when you go there and you go to the casino, if you're a recreational player, if you're someone who aspires to be a professional, you start saying like, well, do I want to play with these guys who've been playing for 15 years and this is all they do all day long. They don't have a life outside of that. Or do I want to go play this game pop in Omaha where equities are closer together and it seems like the professionals in the game aren't as big nits. Like it just, people aren't necessarily talking about strategies and, and solvers at the table. It's not like, it's just, I mean, to me, it's just such a different atmosphere. When you go there, it's, there's no strategy talk. There's just gamble it up talk. There's people cracking aces with some random four card hand. I mean, it's just, yeah, it, it's stuff like that. You see a lot more often that I think make the game fun for players and kind of go back to, you know, big main point is just how do we make the game more fun I'm not sure what we do for the for for a lot of the Texas Hold'em cash games and for a lot of the the habits of players have sort of been ingrained now for a, a multitude of years and I don't know how we fix that and we've seen private games become a lot more popular because of this like if you're these guys you know these guys these guys don't want to play with the with the geniuses who don't say much and don't talk they don't they have no interest to play with these guys they've tried they have they didn't have fun They're, they they don't want to play with those guys anymore so that's why I think we've seen an, an influx of private games and you think they would actually um, learn like take someone like Antonio who's been playing in, in private games and uh, you know for a long time and stuff he'll take your money and you'll thank him for it right that, I mean that's the poker hustle is you're supposed to be having fun people uh, people who are worth you know a hundred times what we are worth want to sit down and just have some fun they don't want to hear about strategy they don't want to hear about this, they don't, want, they don't want a death stare from you every time that they make a bet. They want to have fun. They don't care whether they want to lose. I mean, obviously they, to an extent they care, but at the end of the day, it's entertainment money for them. You know, And that's what uh, these geniuses should be thinking about is how do we make it fun for everyone to play yeah. so that people, so people aren't afraid to sit down at the table with us. You know? Well, how do you think that is? What Do you think that's just a, a function of speaking more or do you think that's a function of the way that you dress a combination of things like like i I've, to me it just seems like you engage people in conversation that's what i try to do when i go play i'm sure that's i, I can imagine that's what you probably try to do when you go play too you it seem like you have like, i have a good time you go talk you 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 tell a story or something like that i don't know you ask a, a fucking question about their life or something like that it seems like these it's are pretty that, easy it's things not that hard, dude. It's, it's really <laughs> not that hard just just be human you know don't be a robot be be human yeah you know? um you know, ask a question, get, you know, answer a question, not, uh, oh, yeah, so how long have you been playing poker? Five years. I mean, dude, that's not, you know, even you see, you watch some of the interviews that they give, like, um, at some of these times, you go, are you fucking serious what you just answered that question? The, the interviewer with all full exuberance is asking you a really good question and they give them a three-word answer. Like I know it's not doesn't come natural to most people, mm -hmm. and I I respect that I appreciate that you know someone like yourself like me, it's easy for us to talk. Other people find it really hard, right? But okay, but understand this is the profession that you've chosen. Work on some of the things that are going to help you increase your EV, you know, right. rather than um, sitting there quietly and not and not talk. Um, something that I want to talk about when you were talking before. Sorry. I can't believe, and this is all credit, how much more professional poker has become for these young players. They work so hard, they study so hard, they play. They're like, that's a big positive for them, big positive for uh, their win rates and everything. Unfortunately, if they don't keep the human element involved, they'll kill the games. Because people don't want to play with them anymore. Yeah. So from one on one hand, it's great how much work they're doing, and I totally applaud them because I, I couldn't do that much work what they're doing, especially now at my age. I don't give a stuff. I just want to go and play. Right. I'll do a little bit of you know study, and then the rest is I just want to play. I, you know, leave me alone. But good on them. I mean, that's that's where the game's going, and they understand. 
I guess, especially to try and be an online uh, winning player, the amount of study that you have to do is, is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, sense. for sure. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, I see I see both sides of it because I know what it takes to, to become uh, a, a successful online player. And it, it takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of locking yourself in there, staring at the screen for hours and hours and hours, studying, mm -hmm. talking only poker. Like, to you, it's just your world is trying to become great at poker and trying to win at poker, and you don't really care or thinking about anything outside of that. So I can understand having that take on things. And I mean, people, you know, the, the dealing with the downswings and the upswings and being in markup, or if you're playing some of these games, like I, I can just imagine you don't necessarily aren't in a jovial mood. You don't want to talk. You don't want to say much. So I get where a lot of the guys come from too. It's just, you know, and also, you know, kind of, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, we had a lot of personalities who were at the top of poker, or we perceived them to be at the top of poker who were very jovial, Gregorious. You had Mike Mattis out talking constantly. His nickname's The Mouth. And a lot of those guys really aren't aren't around anymore. They aren't playing those games anymore for a function of whether it's just too hard or whether they they you know they they don't have the in and to study and kind of keep up with what's going on. But mm -hmm. those personalities are now replaced with other personalities, and those personalities that tend to succeed at the highest stakes of poker right now tend to be the more introverted kinds who keep to themselves, and they aren't necessarily going to be doing a mic the mouth mm -hmm. tirade ever really i don't think they're ever going to do it publicly so yeah it's uh you know good and bad i guess there's there's some good some bad out of that but yeah i think from a, a fan perspective yeah it's not as not as exciting yeah i i, I agree i don't know what to do about that to be honest but you know all, all i can the way i look at it is that i i can do my part you know whenever i'm playing right and uh, try and make it fun and, and, and enjoy myself as well. It's not just a show. Just I want to enjoy myself as well. That's how I have fun. And I seem to play heaps better when um, I'm in that sort of atmosphere and that sort of mood rather than being on tilt from the nits that, is, that I'm playing with. You know, Wait, <laughs> funny do, about that. Do do nits and short stackers put you on tilt when you play PLO cash games? Uh, you have no idea. I just, want, <laughs> I just chase them so hard. <laughs> so I bust them so hard. I think one thing that I like to do, and, and if any nits watch this and then they play with me, they're gonna know what I'm. Man, I guess whatever. But what I like to do is I like to just call. I like to call the nits nits. Like if you're a nit, I just want to call you a nit. And my thinking and what's happened a lot in the past is that the nits they they don't like being called nits, so they start opening up. They start playing ranges they are uncomfortable with. They start putting themselves in some spots deep stacked, hopefully mm -hmm. against you that they're uncomfortable with. So that's usually my game plan when I go out there. Like if you're a nit, I'm, I'm calling you a nit. If you're a short stacker, I'm gonna say, why are you short stacking? Like, let's add some fucking chips on there and let's play some pop, no, let's play some deep stack poker here. So I don't know. I like to rile the nits and the short stackers up personally. <laughs> See, but I agree with you, but part of what they're doing is about, is from, you know, what I spoke about before about in their mind, this is the how to increase their win rate the most. So they're not again, they're looking thinking about themselves and their pocket and not the game. Which I don't know, whatever. Like you said, just just call them out and, and then just try and stack them. That's what I try and do. Well, I mean, you, you brought up a really interesting point, which is that what can we do, right? We can try to do our part, whether whatever platform you have or whatever, whatever people that are going to listen to you or when the times you go out there and play, I think, you know, on an individual level, that's where it kind of starts at is you go out there and play and you try to educate the people around you to say, hey, let's make this game more fun. You try to tell your friends, hey, let's let's try to do this and, and kind of start yeah. there. And then it kind of maybe gets up to this level where me and you were having a conversation about it. And then we're talking about it. And then people out there are listening and say, oh, shit, that they bring up really good points. And these aren't necessarily new things no one's ever said. We've been saying these things for years. A lot of people have in poker. So it's aren't new things, but you hope at some point in time it finally gets through to people. And then we have some sort of movement. And I think we are seeing that a little bit more now with, with certain players being more vocal about it. But I think it does take people that are ambassadors and people that are leaders of our community to sort of step up there and even be annoyingly out there and say, hey, like, we got to fucking fix this. Like, this has to this has to change because it goes this way and that way. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like this is, this is kind of what we can do about it. And this is the, I think we're making pretty good effort just having this conversation about our people. I did, I did notice a shift a few years ago. The, the players that were like um, in their early 20s were now like 27, 28. And just maturity-wise, they'd, they'd realized they had to change their attitudes and personalities. And I, I watched these guys go from 21 to 28. And they 
absorbed exactly what you and I were talking about. And they were now telling the younger generation what they should be doing. So maybe part of it is a maturity thing. You know, like as at 21, you're a different person to the person you are at 27. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe that's part of it as well. How, how much of a different person am I going to be? So you're you're allegedly, listen, I got to see an ID or something like that. But according to Wikipedia here, it says you're over 50. I, I, I still don't believe this. I was watching some of the Instagram stuff on there. You're dancing in Greece with your daughter. I'm like, how, I'm like, how, like, how old is this guy? I'm, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, look it up. Are you sure? So how much different am I going to change? I'm 33 now. You're 52. Is that right? Yeah. How much? How much do I, am I going to change from thirty-three to fifty-two? What's, what are what are some of the things that that happen? What are you talking about physiologically? <laughs> well, however, the mindset-wise approach to life, like that sort of thing, like that. How, how how do you feel like you've changed personally from from this age, thirty-three to to fifties? You become way more philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you uh, rather than being so opinionated and thinking that you know everything, you um, you realize that there's so much more to know and, and to, you know, I'm, I'm by nature a very judgmental person. Um, I've been told lately that I'm becoming less judgmental, which is a really good thing for me. Um, but yeah, I think you, you just look at life differently. Like, um, I was like a bull in a china shop, you know, for most of my life. And now maybe I'm like a, Go in a china shop, <laughs> not a bull. So when you say a bull, like what did that mean in terms of what, just being wild or in terms of, yeah. I guess, like gambling? As in or... being, yeah, like I'm, uh, I'm not one to uh, walk away from confrontation. You know, like if there's something that I believe in, I'll just go, dude, what's your problem? You know, let's let's deal with this. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not like, um, I'm not that sort of person that can just, um, just walk away from shit. Um, but as you get older, you go, well, you know what? They're entitled to their opinion. And it's, it, it means nothing to me anyway, so let them go. You know, like, I don't know. Maybe you just get tired as you get older too from from headbutting people, you know, or headbutting with people, I should say. Yeah, maybe it's uh, you, you, you decide that you don't really have to convince everyone of what you believe in or anything yeah. like that too. It could be something like that. Maybe you sort of realize at some point it just clicks and you're like, well, I've been trying to do it this way for a while and like people don't really change their mind. So why am I trying to convince all these people of my beliefs and that sort of thing like that? And eventually you sort yeah. of just, I don't know, maybe, maybe you stick, do you feel like you stick to people that have yeah. similar beliefs that, that you have? And those are the people you yeah. tend to be friends with. I think it's, that's a natural thing. A, a few years ago, I uh, made, uh, two New Year's resolutions and I've never made any before, any after. And it was at the end of a, um, a year of, of pure frustration for me. And then the resolutions were, um, firstly, never give my advice to anybody who doesn't ask for it. Because hmm. one of these guys, I was one of these guys that if I heard you say something like, like oh, hey, listen, maybe you should try this because could, it could help you, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know whether I was doing that for you or doing that for me. Like honestly, like you know, did it, I, was I doing it because it made me feel better about myself, or was I doing it because I genuinely want to help you? Mm -hmm. But I felt like I was just blowing hot air for no reason, right? And I I realized that um, opinions are only valuable if they're actually asked for. If it's not asked for, if it's if it's for free, then who cares? You know, people don't really listen to you half the time that changed that helped me so much in my life and the other one was that i said i'm going to stop correcting people when they're wrong <laughs> like who am i what are, who made me the fucking police to correct people when they're wrong right and it was something that i couldn't help myself oh no that's not right no what are you talking about like dude let, let the guy fucking say what he wants unless he's having a conversation with me and he's trying to make make convince me of something that I disagree with, you know, I'd be, I'd jump over tables and go, Hey, that's wrong. You know what you're saying there. I don't know why I was doing that, but that, that, um, gave me a lot more peace internally as well. Cause I found that I didn't, you know, like you said, I don't have to fix the world. I just have to, you know, make sure that I'm doing okay. So do you feel like you've been able to achieve these resolutions that you said, the only resolutions you've made? And if you've achieved them, 
Sounds like you should make some more because it's probably a good strategy to actually yeah, carry I, through I, with these I, things. I've kind of lived lived by those um, for ninety five percent of the time since I made them. I've I've slipped up occasionally, but then I catch myself um, slipping back into my old ways, and I'll, I'll pull myself back out of it. But it really it, it made my life a lot easier. You know, you know how you go you go through life and you go. Um, fuck, this is hard. Why am I having such a hard time with this? Why am I having such a hard time with that? And you realize that actually it's you. Mm-hmm. You're, you're opening the door. It's like when people say, people always screw me over. Well, maybe it's you that's allowing them to screw you over. Yeah. Change something about yourself, you know? And I was getting constantly frustrated trying to help people and no one would listen. And I thought, yeah, well, okay. So stop. Unless people actually come at you for, for sincere help, stop just giving your help out for free. Um, and that was exhausting, I'm telling you, it was just exhausting. And it, that helped, it changed my life a lot. Yeah, I always um, I always look at it like, I, I kind of never necessarily been that that person to try to give people advice or feedback. Cause the times I've tried are usually with my um, family and that never actually works out ever. They look at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, okay, they maybe they put, maybe they made it a little bit, uh, just desire to do that for me just hasn't been there because I, I've, I've, you know, tried to help out people around me. My little brother is, I think, a person that I try to help out and, and he seems receptive to it. But I feel like for me, if I ever, if I'm talking with someone and I feel like I'm giving them something I really believe in that can help them. And then when they're just like, eh, whatever, like to me, it's just, I don't, it makes it feel very unhappy. I'm just like, well, fuck, why aren't you listening? Is it something, is it, you know, so I feel like I've experienced that and I'm just like, I don't really want to experience that. So if someone I know is receptive to it, or if it's some sort of coaching thing, or it's like an organized thing, then it's a different story. But yeah, I, I'm never really, I, I don't I don't think I am, but maybe I am because I do fucking YouTube videos and I, I put out tweets sometimes that are, you'd be considered advice and maybe I am. So I don't know, maybe I'm in, very incorrect about this and, uh, and I might be wrong. I'm curious what people think out there, but yeah, I, I try to stay away from that too. I'm not trying to, I don't know. I, I imagine, I guess, like, where do you think that comes from for yourself? Because like, where do you think this, this desire, this, this quality of, uh, of kind of voicing what you believe in, even when people might not want to hear it, where do you think that comes from? Uh, I'm, I know where it comes from. I'm the eldest of my family and I've had responsibility since the age of seven. Hmm. I've had to do everything for myself, basically. So I've always been um, the head of the family. Right. And you're like, you're the leader. As child, head of the family, you're constantly telling other people what to do. It just, that's the fact of life. It's, and it's, it becomes your natural state. So trying to convince, you know, talk yourself out of it and realize that you don't need to be that person in every situation. You can sit back and just watch the world go by occasionally. Um, you know, once you realize it, it's actually uh, quite good, but realizing it at the start, it uh, took me a long time. To <laughs> took you for 50 years, huh? <laughs> a good 50 years, man. 50 years, man. What do, you, what do you think? What was like the turning point? Like what happened? Did something happen? Did you have a conversation? And you were like, well, well fu- oh, fuck, I, this, this, this has to stop. Like I can't do this anymore to myself. <laughs> I think, um, like I said a few years ago, it was one, I had a year that I was so frustrated. They, like I have friends who um, keep getting themselves into trouble financially. And how many fucking times can I say the same thing and give them, you know, a thousand different scenarios to try and, and it's like, yep, 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 yep. And then next month, the same thing happens. I'm mm. like, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to be your friend. You know, if you want to complain to me, you can complain to me. I'll sit here and listen, but I'm not going to try and fix you anymore because you're unfixable. And that, that year was... I had a hard year, like, not that, I mean, I suffered, but it was exhausting that I was mentally, I'm like going, why don't you f- listen? Like, you know, you come and ask for the advice and you still don't listen. Like, it was just driving me nuts. Or, no, you don't come and ask for advice. You go, you come and complain to me and I give you the advice of how to correct it. And it's not like, it wasn't rocket science. It was very simple things. Don't buy shit you can't afford. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how hard is that, right? Don't buy shit you can't afford, you know? Don't go, you know, buying a car that you can't afford. Don't b- buy the handbag that you can't afford. Yeah. And do it for a couple of years until you get your feet back on the ground. Then, you know, go for it. Very simple financial advice. 
And that, by the end of that year, it was like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And that's when I just flipped the switch. And now I'll sit there and people, whatever, unless they specifically come up to me and say, hey, Joe, I'm having a problem with this. Can I ask your advice? Then, you know. But it's not it's not a perfect system, by the way. I, I break it many times, I know. <laughs> not that I can remember off the top of my head, but I'm sure I break it many times. But, the, you know, in theory, it's it, it works and it helps me. It, it, it um it saves that waste of, waste of energy. So what are your relationships like now? Do you have like a, a core group of friends? Do you have a, a, someone that you date or what's kind of like, what's your, what's your situation like? My friendship group has always been small. I'm, I'm, I'm friendly to everyone, but I don't let many people become my friend. Hmm. So um, I don't think in my lifetime I've ever had a group of more than 10 close friends. You know? Um, and I think in my lifetime, I probably lost, as in lost friendships, um, two or three friends. Like in at 52, I'm not doing too bad, you know. Yeah. But uh, that helped me a lot. Like after winning the World Series, obviously everyone comes out of the woodwork, <laughs> wants to be your manager, wants to be your fucking friend, wants to be your brother, your sister, your cousin, whatever. Um, having that standoffish personality where, and people think I'm, uh, people who don't know me think I'm actually quite arrogant. But it's not arrogance. It's like, dude, if I don't know you, I'll say hi, how are you? And then I'm fine. It takes me quite a long time to warm up to people, to become their friend. And I can be really friendly with you. Like, for example, um, at the poker table, people come up to me five years later and go, hey, remember we played in 2013? And we played all day, day one. We drank together. And I don't remember shit, right? But in the moment, we had a good time. Yeah. Um, so that, that protects me um, as a person because I value the friendship that I can give to people. Mm -hmm. So why should I give that out for free? You know, unless somebody uh, proves themselves worthy of my friendship, and I'm not trying to be arrogant here, I'm, I'm, it's a, it's a uh, self-protection mechanism because my brother's the exact opposite to me and he befriends He'll walk into a bar within 10 minutes, he's singing Kumbaya with everyone, right? That's my brother, right? But he, he's a lot better now because he's had to learn the hard way. But he went through so many situations where he just got burned, 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 burned by people, you know? Because if you make friendships too easily, then they're gonna, you're going to lose them too easily. Whereas if you take your time, it's like, a rela like any relationship, you know? The guy that gets married after three months of dating is more likely to be divorced than the guy who's been with someone for a couple of years and got to know them properly, mm -hmm. correct? So it's the same thing. In theory. These days, I don't know, I feel like people are getting married pretty quickly these days. And Yeah, these days I, I, I feel, are you married? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not married, no. I feel sorry for you guys. Friends. I'm coming up to my 30 year anniversary next year. You've been married 30 years? Yeah. Holy moly, guacamole. How, how's, how, what's the secret to that? How do you do it? Dude, it's hard bloody work, mate, let me tell you. Uh, at the end of the day, it's compromise. It's respect and compromise. Simple. Simple. And it's not... Um, I, I feel like today's uh, youth give up too easily. They have too many options between social media and, you know, there's just too many options, dude. Like, you know, well, why do I have to settle for this? Oh, I'll just turf this and go on to something else. Um, we were brought up in an era where you got married, you got married for life. It wasn't an option to... You know, but in saying that, I think what's been the strength of my wife uh, and my relationship has been, and we've had, you know, our ups and downs like every couple has, mm -hmm. but we've just, at the end of the day, we loved each other and we knew that the, um, the greater good was working it out, not working out how to get out of it. So we always worked it out. Whether we had a fight for two weeks or whether we had a fight for two hours, in the in our mind it was like, okay, so I had a fight, so okay, I'm, I was really angry yesterday, but where am I going? Like, she's my wife, mother of my kids, he's my husband, you know, the father of my kids, where am I going? You know, I love the guy, he's, you know, it's not like, um, there's, as long as nothing really, really bad happens in the relationship, everything should be able to be, be worked out. But today, 
people don't give a shit. They go, no, it's not working. I'm out of here. You know, it's it's. Uh, I feel sorry for the youth of today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as you said, with the options out there and with the with Instagram, with Twitter, with, with the dating apps, with, I mean, there's just so many different things oh, out there. Uh, with the ease that, it, that you can send a message on Facebook to anyone, you can send a DM to anybody you want. And it's, it's just like, it makes sense. And plus you see the best representation of, of all these people out there in the world that you don't know. And you say, well, like, well, look at that guy. Look at this girl. Look at this life. Look at what this trip. Look at that. Like, you see all these 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 best moments and... I mean, I think it's pretty bad for a lot of people because I talk with people and, and they just seem super unhappy. They're talking about this person, that person. I go, well, that guy's not very happy. Like, I know that Dude, guy. Like, I what know. About fo- what about FOMO? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a, there's a lot of FOMO going on, I think. That, that, that's what you're talking, but that's exactly what you're talking about. It's FOMO. Right. It's this whole Snapchat thing and whatever. Oh, I don't want to miss out on that. And so people are miserable because they're looking at pictures of the highlight of, highlight of someone's day. Mm-hmm. That's not their life. It's just a, it's a, it's a second of their day. You know, and people go, oh, well, I want that as well. Or when you know, people, you know, girls load up pictures of their bags or guys of their cars or whatever. Like, I, it's terrible, mate. I, I actually, oh, you know, honest to God, I, you see that I do post uh, on Instagram, I do post on Twitter, but quite often I'm doing it just because I know that. Um, the people that follow me want to see, want, to, want me to touch base with them about what I'm doing. I couldn't give a shit about uploading stuff. Like, I don't know, like, obviously I'm way out of that, um, that age bracket because it's not my thing. But my daughter, my son, everything, every meal they eat, they've got to upload. <laughs> Fuck, dude. What's up with that? What's up with having to upload? We're not allowed to... Um, dig into a dish until they've taken a Snapchat of it. Like, uh, do you get that? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I guess if people, um, if anyone who's like follows me on Instagram, I don't really post a lot of stuff about myself. I usually tend to post about other things happening in poker or like funny moments or because I, 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 I sort of. I don't know. I've never really been big on sort of sharing a lot of information about myself or like these personal details. I've done it bits of time, but not really too much. So I'm not really big on like, this is what I'm eating. This is that. And it probably is like kind of dates back to when I was in my mid twenties, when I first started making money, I'd be posting all these money photos on Facebook. And then like, I'm like, I'm the man, like I got all this, holy shit, you know, I got this money, this and that. And then I started like talking with with family or friends and they're like, you kind of hear like what people are saying about you. They're, they're like resentful, they're angry at you or like they're, they're whatever, like they don't say nice things about you. And you're like, well, maybe, maybe I don't want to portray myself like that. And I think whether bad or good, I think what happened was just in my later twenties, I just decided that I'm not really going to talk like that. I'm not really going to post like that. I'm not really going to kind of be about that sort of way. And at the time I thought like, that's what would gain me respect or would make people proud of me or, or whatever, show people that I was successful. And I don't think I necessarily have to do that anymore. I think like kind of what I've done speaks for itself in terms of success. And I don't necessarily have to put it out there in terms of money or in terms of or followers or in terms of any of these things like that. Whereas I think when I was younger, like that was just this, that was like all it was. That's what I thought success was when I'm in my, when I'm growing up, I'm like, you make money like that, that. To me, that's how it was. Yeah. I, I have a strong belief that if you deserve the praise, you'll get it. Right. That's, you know, like I, I remember a, a very specific time in 05. I think it may have been day five of the main event. And uh, that's a time when everyone, a lot more than now, everyone was was doing crazy shit to get the cameras to come over to them so that they could be on television. Doesn't happen so much uh, in today's poker. Um, and I said to my table mates, I said, guys, because they were all getting excited, I said, guys, please, can we just play poker? Can we not act like lunatics? If we deserve the attention, we'll get it. You know, can we just, because getting your head on television, uh, acting like a dickhead, isn't gonna win you any points. So I know you all want to be on TV. I want to be on TV too. So I'm not like, unlike you, but let's just play. And if we deserve the attention, the cameras will come by themselves. And that kind of set the scene for the day. So we had no craziness at our table. Uh, and like even till today, you know, I, I strongly believe if I deserve the attention, then I will get it. If I, if I don't deserve it, then I'm not chasing it. Whereas the other people have got different ideas of, of how to get attention to themselves. Yeah, well, I think kind of what you find now is that when you do act that way, like a Will Kasuf, 
you uh, are pretty much uh, you're, you're dealing with a lot of backlash. I mean, it's not like you yeah. get some praise and you get people like, oh, you're, you're the man. I want to suck your dick, whatever. Like you get people that say that. But you get a lot of people that are like, you are the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen in my life. I hope you die. You are a scumbag. Like, I don't think anyone like I don't think people want to deal with that, if you, especially if you're on social media. Like you don't want to go on social media and just hear people telling you how you're the biggest piece of shit they've ever seen in their life because you talked a lot during a poker hand like I, I mean so i think whereas before a lot of those those sort of personalities maybe the havad khan the bulldozer like maybe that was that was what was in or that was something that people aspired to be like because they saw mike madison or phil Hummuth. but now a lot of that is for whatever reason i'm not actually sure why it's very looked down upon even like tony g i'd be curious to see how tony g would be received if he came along now he's talking about on your bike and fucking bring on the rush he's talking about He's a pretty big trash talker, man, and and I feel like he's so loved. But now, if he came, I don't know if he'd be as loved. I, I don't know what separates. See, yeah, I I think when you talk about Tony G, um, Matisau Helmuth, especially Matisau Helmuth, that's who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, more of it comes out on television, but that's who they are when they're playing, you know. Whereas the other guys were actually doing shit to get attention. Mm -hmm. For the cameras, Madison can't help himself. I love Mike, right? But there's no way he can. He could not shut up if you if you paid him a thousand dollars an hour. He could not shut up, right? How with there's nothing you can do to stop him from having his blobs. He is who he is, you know. Um, and and Tony G, I know, I know Tony G quite well as well. Like he would have um, orchestrated some of those things, but it was also part of his game, part of his his, his tactic. These guys that. You were talking about like Havard Khan. He was doing that strictly to get the camera. You know, when he, I remember, did, did he do the big monkey, the big gorilla thing or something? Or? Ooh, 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 something like that. Yeah. I think it was like a dance yeah, like yeah. that or something like I, that. I, yeah, I, yeah. I remember watching I'm going, oh my God. And he's such a nice guy because I, I got to meet him like a year later or something after that. And I go, dude, what's up with that? <laughs> he goes, I don't know. I just want to get the cameras onto me. Like, you know, but like you said, today that wouldn't be that would probably be frowned on. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be, they would look, I guess, well, kind of thinking back on you, what is the thing that people say to you the most when, if they meet you, what do they, what do they say? There's gotta be one thing they say to you, right? Uh, one saying that you might have that has. Oh, yeah, pass the sugar is like, that's, I've heard that, <laughs> you know, I still hear it. Yeah, I think that that's that's one. I think I would say like that one, and then Aussie, 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 oi, oi, which yeah, might be like yeah. a big Australian thing. But I mean, now anytime yeah. you hear that, you pretty much associate it with you at the final table, winning the main event, Aussie, 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 mm -hmm. holding up the flag. I mean, that's a pretty iconic moment right there. You know, it's like a moment that 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 lives on in poker for yeah. forever when they show the yeah. highlight reels and stuff like that. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, and you know the um the pass the sugar moment as well. That was pure emotion. Like that, I, I still remember. And I remember when, when he turned over his hand, he had top set, not flopped and not flush. I, I slammed my hand and I said, pass sugar without realizing that he had top set. And you never you never, never supposed to say pass sugar unless you've actually got the, the, got the pot. The sugar right? is getting passed your way. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I remember walking around the table and going, what the fuck? What did I just do, dude? Please don't pay the board now. Because, <laughs> like, you know, I wasn't safe yet. You know? uh, yeah. But yeah. I like pass the sugar. That's a, I, I haven't, I feel like I, I've never used that line personally because I don't know why. Maybe I need to start working in pass the sugar in my line. I don't really have like a, a saying I use when I win a hand. I usually just try to, I, I don't know what I try to do. I silently pump inside and, but I'm, and I'm, okay. inside I'm excited, but in the outside I try to be respectful of my opponent for the most part, unless it's a friend, in which case I'm talking a lot of shit to them. Shout out to my friend Doug or shout out to anyone I've played some of my invite only games with because. Uh, then you have a dig, you have a nice dig at them. Well, they said they need all the shit out of me. I got I got to give it to them back. You know, I think when you're playing with friends and, and you guys are needling each other or slow rolling each other. And what do you think about slow rolls, by the way? You, you, you a fan of slow rolls in games where you may know the other people or do you not like to get slow rolled by people that you know? Um, it depends on the stake of the game, the, the size of the game. Yeah, it's in a, a good serious game, I don't, I don't want to see a slow roll. I don't want to be slow roll because it's, a you know, if we're playing a 5-10 game, you know, my buddy slow rolls me for a five hundred dollar pot. Yeah, fun. I'll do. I'll do the same back. You know, but 
I, I, I'm actually so dumb. I always forget to slow roll. <laughs> I'm just like, I go, that's it. I'm going to get him next time. I'm going to get him next time. Then I forget to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Because my, my, my intuition, my, my natural state is not thinking about a state as slow roll. That's a, in, I, the, in the serious game, like I've seen it. Um, you may have heard of, uh, uh, what's his name? Warwick Muzakidian. Uh, have you heard of that guy? That guy? Warwick? What's the name? Warwick. Warwick? Where does Warwick he... Muzakidian. He's, uh, he's an Aussie guy. Mm -mm. He plays a lot of the high stakes PLO games. And his favorite pastime is to slow roll. He'll slow. <laughs> I, I was I remember playing at the Bellagio in a fifty one game and he's done it to everybody at every state possible. Like he doesn't care, right? He's got no filter. He slow rolled this poor kid. It was like an eighty thousand dollar pot. Wow. And I and wow. I was he was in seat one, I was in seat nine. And I remember just sinking in my chair as as the slow roll was taking place. I mean, you knew it was coming. They knew, yeah, because they knew that I knew him and I knew it was coming, right? And the guy the poor kid just turned white. Like he was already white, but he just went, he lost all blood from his face. Because what Warwick's getting in there, you got it. Yeah, yeah. You know, good call, you got it. And as as soon as the kid started reaching for the chips, Warwick's turned over the nut flush. Fuck, yeah, that's brutal. That's brutal. Uh, right mate, he's, yeah. But he loves it. That's his favorite pastime. In Asia, apparently, well, I know I've been slow rolling a ton of times in Asia. Asians love doing it too. They love doing it to each other. They, they love doing it to strangers as well. They love slow rolling. But I'm not a big fan, though. Yeah, I find it uh, quite fascinating how, and I, I don't want to necessarily group these together, but when you have a, someone that slow rolls someone or if you have, I, okay, these aren't grouped together, angle shooting too. People, like, they hate anyone that slow rolls or angle shoots with a, a deep passion that I've never seen before in anything else in poker. Like if you were an angle shooter, like I did a video about men, the master, like the live at the bike, the Armenian mic talking about making a joke and he, I'm joking. I I'm joking. Yeah. Like, <laughs> have you ever seen that before? Like someone made a bet, he, he gets that's called and he's like, I'm that's joking. Disgusting. Like what, what the, what the hell have you, what are you, what are you joking dude? What are you joking? <laughs> How can you be joking? I don't know. I've I've never seen it like that before in poker. I mean, it's yeah. just. But people, they they. I I don't I don't think this is warranted. But like that Armenian Mike and in the comments and the videos are like he like once again he's the biggest comeback I've ever seen. I'm like whoa. Like listen, I don't we don't know much enough about the guy to say this guy is like the worst human being of all time. He's, he he he's an idiot. All right, he's an idiot. He told a bad joke. He thought he was a joke teller. Whatever. He's he's you know fucking whatever he's trying to do. Angle shooting here. But he's not the worst guy ever. But I just find this like overreaction from these people who who are probably out of line in their own ways in their own life like i just find it so fascinating because I, I can't figure out like where they're coming from because when i see someone angle shooting i'm not like this guy's like the biggest piece i've ever seen it's more like yeah i mean that's that's not good and, and i should watch out for that in the future and i probably don't want to play with that fucking guy and that guy should be looked up looked upon as doing that but like i don't think they're the worst person i've ever seen in my entire life that's a symptom of uh being anonymous online though that's been that's been like that for ages. Like go back to uh, playing poker online. The level of abuse, the things that come out of in the chat box, of what people say. Hope you get cancer. Hope you hope your mother gets cancer. I mean, fuck <laughs> man. Who are these people? They're like I mean, the guy obviously uh, this uh, Armenian Mike guy Armenian Mike, really yeah, bad and stupid, but. Like he's now he's the biggest douchebag you've ever seen. He's the biggest whatever. Do you know this guy? He did one wrong thing, right? You know? And he, he may be a douchebag, right? But and, and they just take the, the the whole thing about being anonymous and online uh, takes cowardice to a whole new level, dude. A whole new level yeah. because they they would never say that to their face. Right. Anyone, anyone ever it? told you that, Joe? Anyone come up to you and, and, and say some names to you or, or talk some shit to you that they might say online to you? I've never, never. It didn't happen to me yet, so I don't. maybe it's happened to you. I'm not sure. No, never. It's uh, quite the opposite. Um, obviously, because of my profile, I, I copped some stuff online. Um, and then I'd meet the guy in real life, and he'd apologize for being stupid online. And be a really nice guy. Hmm. Like I don't understand. Like why? Why does it bring out the worst? Yeah. Do you know? 
That's what I've wondered literally, too. Literally, like, literally come up to me and go, hey, uh, I was that guy, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's happened to me like two or three times over the course of uh, my career. Um, and just want to let you know, I was just, you know, we're just having fun. I go, dude, how can you call that having fun? <laughs> you know, you were insulting me. You were like, I just want to apologize. Um, uh, no hard feelings. And we shake hands. And then we'd end up having a conversation, having a drink later, like, he turns out to be a decent guy, but for whatever reason, uh, in that in that moment online, decides to just go to the lowest of lows. Yeah, and hit hit below the belt. Yeah. To be to be it's, first... a, it's the whole thing with kind of being anonymous online. Like that's you know it happens on on Twitter a lot. You know that you can see you know the shit that happens on Twitter too. Yeah, tw- Twitter's a pretty. Uh... I don't, I'm always a big oh. fan of, I, I just block people. Like if somebody says something to me, I, I never seen them before. I just block them. Like whether it's on I'm YouTube just, I'm, or, I'm the same thing. yeah, I'm just like, I got, I'm not trying to deal with, I don't, I don't care what you got to say. I'm not trying to overcome it. I'm not going to unblock anybody, even though I probably have maybe two or three times, but I got a pretty strict block policy. If you're just, if you're bringing like some sort of toxicity to me and I've never seen you before, I don't know who you are. I'm just like, yeah. that's it. I don't want to communicate with you ever again. Yeah. Occasionally like you'll put up a tweet and, you get some guy you've never seen before make some really terrible comment. I go, okay, just block. I, I, I don't, I don't give them the satisfaction of interacting with them. Whereas a lot of guys will, you know, want to argue with them. They're nobody to me. Like, just block. I'm done with them. You know, they're, they're out of my life. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned that the chatting on the poker site, and I, I gotta be, I gotta be. Uh, I've talked about this before. I was pretty uh, out of line with some of my chatting. Back in the day, but my also my name was there. People knew who I was. I posted all the time on two plus two, and these are usually regulars. I was telling that I want to fucking kill them because they ran so fucking good against me. And uh, you know what happens? It happens in our lives. We all learn from that. Shout out to Yusuf Ahmed, a young Australian. I actually remember this one time when I moved to Australia, and there was this guy I used to play, always play PLO with, called Yusuf Ahmed on Poker Stars. And I talked to him now a little bit. Uh, no, we're friendly now, but. At the time, he ran so good. I'm like, dude, this guy's a fucking cheater, first of all. He's, like, got some God Mode program. And in the chat, I'd be like, listen, I want to fucking, like, I want to kill you. And I'm not, I'm not happy about this at the time. I don't think I'm serious. But when I moved to Australia, I was like, listen, let's meet up right now. Like, one of us ain't leaving. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. Like, looking back, also, I'm in a big downswing. Like, I'm not emotionally there with my mind. I'm partying. Like, you know, it ain't all, the chemicals ain't right at that time in my life. But... I just remember like hitting him up, like like in the chat. I'm like, listen, me and you right now, like let's me up. We're fucking ending this right now. This is not gonna happen anymore. And I'm like, what the hell? What was I thinking, man? You know, I just look back and I'm like, what a you fucking idiot I was, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm. We've all said things that we regret, dude. You know, I have as well. I don't think there's anybody who maybe Phil Gelfond. <laughs> That's I what Phil. I'm thinking. I hate Phil so much. I'm How serious. He's just so nice. All the fucking time. I just want to punch him in the face. I love him so much. Listen, I, I try to think about that because I talk, you know, I talk with Phil. We're friends, and I just like I don't. I've never seen a person universally liked. Like he, he is universally liked. I don't know a person that's like I don't like Phil Gaffon. I, I I don't. I can't. I don't know one person. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see when he starts a poker site how that happens because you know people like they're not going to be very happy about something out there. So I'm curious yeah, to see exactly him. yeah what happens with that. He's doing- He's doing it. Um, he's not allowing software programs. Is that right? So no HUDs, I believe. There's, there's, okay. they're gonna do something. But there are other sites that say no HUDs, but there are still programs that pop up where they have some sort of HUD temporarily, like, like Ignition, for example. And I think they say no HUDs, but there is a program you can have where you have a temporary HUD for that session, even with the anonymous table. So you only get maybe ten hands, and then they leave or whatever. But it still exists. But I think they're gonna have it where it's dynamic avatars where depending on how you've been playing at the table, your avatar oh, is going to yes. change. So yeah, so I think yeah. it's, which, cool idea. I'm interested to see how it works out because I think anything that can kind of make things a little more fun at the table and with graphics or with sort of things like that, I think are good for the game. So I'll be curious to see exactly how that changes the game and, and how that impacts things. Can I ask you something? And, and this uh, precedes uh, my comment that I'm going to make after you answer. Um, What's the state now that New Jersey's opened up to Delaware and uh, Nevada? What's the state of influx of new players for online? <laughs> I'm not really sure. Is it, yeah, I is, I, it, is it good? I mean, are there what sort of numbers? Okay, example. I don't know whether you're using any of those sites, but are there what are their 
nightly numbers like uh, their peak numbers. Well, I've looked for cash games and they're not very, uh, oh, they're not very abundant. I mean, there might be a few games kind of going on at all the various stakes combined. So I, I think just the marketing I've seen here in Nevada, whether it's different in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, I'm not sure. I'm, I've just never been out there. I don't know how it works out there. But I think in Nevada, the marketing I've seen is awful. It, they don't really market things. They're not really anywhere on social media. There's no content being put out there. It's very basic sort of, I guess, brand awareness to what's happening. So yeah, to me, it seems like in, in Nevada here, it, there's really not much going on. It's it's pretty tragic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that'll change if more states get added, but we're years away from more states getting added. Pennsylvania just mm -hmm. got up and going. Poker Stars, I think, is going to be added there. I'm not sure on the exact date for that, but it's sometime soon. But those are just a few states. I think it's four, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Nevada. But yeah, I don't think we're, uh, we're anywhere close to this bringing a lot of new players. But you do see like a guy like a Scott Blumstein who won the main event last year. He came up in New Jersey so I think we are seeing some young players come up, but I don't know who they are and they're not very visible yeah. on social media, unfortunately. So yeah, I don't know like where you find those guys or how you find out who these people are. I, the, the thing that troubles me um, is where are we gonna get all these new players from? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? To, to reinvigorate. Like I, I love the idea if poker stars and Full Tilt had have acted years ago and and not allowed the HUDs. I think online poker would be a different state right now, even even with Black Friday, right? Um, but I like the idea that he, you know, Phil's site is going to be anonymous, no HUDs, and the dynamic avatar. I think they they're all really good things. But how we're going to attract the new players? Run at once attracts poker players. Mm -hmm. His site is full of dedicated poker players who are trying to become better poker players. There's no successful online site without the social players joining. Where do we get those players? How do we, how do we reinvigorate them? How do we uh, re-excite them to come and, you know, win their seat to the main event on Run at Once Poker or whatever? You know, like, I don't. Know. Well, I, I, I've, I, I don't I've just, know. I've just really realized something interesting, which is video bloggers. Apparently, these video bloggers are having a pretty big impact in poker in America. From this is from a live setting in terms of yeah, I think these guys there's a lot of them out there and they're getting a lot of views collectively on their videos so i do think that with youtube being the new television especially here in america that mm -hmm. we're going to be able to attract a lot of new players through the video bloggers through twitch to some extent but i don't think poker has a strong foothold on twitch where a lot of young people hang out on twitch a lot of young people hang out on youtube but i think outside of that I have no idea. I mean, I think a lot of those young kids are playing Fortnite. They're playing esports games. Mm -hmm. Like, you, there, there's a lot more of a you can dream to make it at esports. I feel like that's a more realistic dream for a lot of people out there than it is to dream at making it at poker. So I don't exactly know where these young kids are coming from. They might be out there. Maybe like we just don't know. We don't talk to them. Like, we yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, I made. I've only met a few kids. Like I was at the Bicycle Casino for a, a PLO week. I met a few, a few guys that were 21, 22. Those are the only guys I've met 21, 22 for the most part. I haven't really met too many of these guys that are trying there to make it at poker. There yeah. aren't too many coming up now because obviously there aren't too many entering. So, and yeah. it's so much harder, as you can appreciate. That's true. I think it's yeah. so much harder today to, to actually to, to build a bankroll. You know, the well, games aren't like what they used to be. What's uh, what's like what, what's the state of uh, the Aussie poker community? Is there any people that are up and coming there, or what, what do you kind of see out there happening? Well. Uh, Online poker just got banned in Australia at the start of the year. Yeah, saw that. Uh, what's going to happen? The the guys that play move to overseas and they're playing overseas. There's how can someone? What new guys can play now? You know, so it's it's a really um, it's not a it's not a good state for online poker. Is there any potential that Stars, after they, I think they uh, acquired William Hill out there, is there any potential chance that Stars might be able to come back there at some point in time? Uh, I actually got it on some good advice that um, potentially their lobbying is going to change um, legislation by the end of the year and online poker should be legal again by middle of next year. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I'm pretty sure PokerStars, by getting involved in buying Crown Bet and uh, whatever, their view to the future is... Yeah, we'll get our foot in the door this way and hopefully we can get, you know, 
get legislation in our favor and get a license in Australia at some point. Yeah, that, that um, was yeah, that was the way I perceived that deal when I read more about the deal. And I, I think I, I talked yeah. with a couple like business reporters out in Australia. I was in a deep dive at the time. I can't remember. I was deep diving David Bezoff and Amaya. And then I started like contacting them. I was like, oh, do you think they'll be back in America, like in Australia? So that was kind of why I thought they acquired that. Only, but they also are trying to build up their sports betting and casino games too. Mm -hmm. So that that would be another reason they would acquire that too. But I, I did imagine. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course, they've got, you know, They've got shareholders to answer to. They've got they pay the shitload of money um, for this company. They need to get some money back to. So I don't blame them for doing what they you know they got to do what they got to do. Well, I believe they did just have one of their biggest quarters ever. So congratulations, Poker Stars, on making your three hundred some million dollars this quarter. Uh, you guys are oh, awesome. Really? Wow. I think they released the earning numbers. I believe uh, I think someone told me about it the other day that they had one of the biggest month. I guess could be the I could be not, but I'm pretty sure this is accurate. What from what I just recently saw. So. Yeah, they're uh, they're doing. What's, what's your what's your state of your poker sponsorship? Are you working with? Uh, are you sponsored by anybody now, or do you work with any companies at all? Or are you you sort of? No, at the moment, I've got no sponsorship. I uh, I finalised my deal with Crown Casino. I had a deal with them for ten years. That finished like uh, eighteen months ago. Um, and I'm not really talking to anybody at the moment about sponsorship. I don't, you know, like I said, I feel so lucky that I, at the height of poker. I had the fucking kingest deal, the best deal ever with the biggest online company in the world. And these poor guys now who um, are, are much better than me, who work 10 times harder than what I do or what I did, and there's nothing for them now. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, um, it's just, stayed, you know, just timing. It's all timing, you know. Like I said, it's all time. You know, we we got treated like royalty because that's what we, you know, basically back then it was like they they were using us to grow their business, and I, I couldn't even imagine how much money I made for PokerStars or for Crank Casino. Like I, I got looked after, but um, between me, Raymer, and um, and MoneyMaker, and MoneyMaker is still with PokerStars because he's he's never leaving PokerStars. Let me tell you right now, he's he's. Pokestars and, and Moneymaker are together for forever because he started all of this, you know, God bless him. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it was, again, yeah, I don't want to harp on it, but whenever the conversation comes up, um, I really feel uh, gratitude for getting my timing right, you know, for running good, you know, at the peak time of when it, I made the most out of it. How much was PokerStars paying back then? I, 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 I mean, I've heard some numbers and estimations, but I, I've, it seemed like they were giving out a lot of money for patches or for deals and all this kind of stuff like that. Oh yeah, the, I mean, you could get fifty thousand dollars just for wearing a patch at a final table or a TV table. Ridiculous, right? Ridiculous. I don't know what, what does eight 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 give them now? Like two thousand, five thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, I don't even think it's that much. I think I talked with someone that was at something this year, and they said they were pushed for eight 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 and. It was a very small amount of money, so yeah, I, it's not quite. But I mean, I, I think um, I listened to a podcast back in a while ago that Brian Ballspa and Daniel were talking about something, and they were saying like, yeah, they're just handing out money, like they don't even know what they're. They, they weren't even like keeping track of it properly and all this kind of stuff like that. I'm oh. like, oh my god, it's just no, dude. They, I'm telling you, they couldn't keep track of it. It was the the companies, both Full Tilt and Stars, were growing so fast and party that. They, they were like uh, narcos, right? They had all this cash coming in. They didn't know what to do with it. Like, it was crazy. The the $1,000 dinners, the you want new shirts, here's new shirts. Go to Versace, buy an outfit because we're doing a, a photo shoot. Fly your family over business class to the Bahamas because we want you there. Like, you look at the that business now and it's the exact opposite where a cup of coffee needs to be accounted for. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because it went from a family run business run by um, three people and a couple of poker guys to now it's their huge corporations. You know, they're proper legit corporations. That's Which true. Is, you know, it's it's fine. It's you know I like I said, I'll just say it one more time. I just got really I really got so lucky to be involved at at that point mm -hmm. when um when it was, you know, uh, was family orientated, generous, gen you know. 
I guess so when you look at your yourself now, like where where do you still have poker goals? Do you have the goals that you set in your own life? Like how do you sort of approach the idea of of what you want to achieve still with yourself? Um good question. Because uh my life goals at the moment center around my business, my businesses, and um, my family, which my family's always been number one. Um, my poker goals kind of have taken a step back just because I'm not playing as much, you know, mm-hmm. and I've got to be realistic. What can I expect to achieve when I'm not putting in the hours, right. you know? Back in 04, 05, I was playing a ton of poker day and night, you know, and it culminated. I, I ran good at the right time and won the World Series and the five dime the following year. And, and I've had, you know, I've had heaps of success since, but those those two years, you know, I think every poker player at some point has a period in their, in their career where they say, that period of time, my run good came then and I make the most of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for some of us, it's it's larger than others, but everyone get, goes through that streak. Um but at this time in my poker career, like um, I, I'm still very passionate about the game. Um, if I have one goal in poker, one uh, to achieve, it's to try and um, help poker go to the next level of uh, acceptance. Um, I've been working on a um, on a poker format for four years, and just recently I've had conversations with Poker Go and Poker Stars, Party Poker about adopting it and uh, to me the one thing that's been that i feel is missing from poker is um we've never had the tribal element the the being part of a team or Mm -hmm. rooting for a team we've never had that they've tried in different formats um i don't believe anybody here well i could be wrong but i don't believe anybody has tried uh to do it with the pure reason to grow poker it's always been for another reason right um for a financial reason right mm-hmm. um and what they what, what they kept leaving out was poker in essence is a game of self-preservation a game of what's in it for me i, I i'm a you know i want to play to win for myself as well but it'd be really cool if i could be part of a team but i still want to win I think I've got that into a format. I'm doing this not for financial reward. I'm doing it because if if I can get people to um, to understand it and follow it, uh, it could change poker. So on that note, um, at Crown, I'm hosting the first ever event of this, the proper event, um, okay. on October 15th. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tape it and do it like a three-minute sizzle reel. Um, and the actual format is very, very simple. It's, it's very simple to follow. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it now, but uh, other than that, it's, a, it's a, a team's event that allows for individuality within it. Mm. Um, and there's no stupid formulas to work out who the best player is. Right, there's no, you know, it's just black and white. They're the best team. He's the best player, and like I've got, like uh, you know, uh, the best player is the MVP um, for for the series. If if I could get this to take, I'm leaning on a lot of personal relationships to get make this happen. We're starting off with 16 teams for the first event. Um, Everyone, I mean, everyone I've spoken to loves the concept. Um, and I had a, an interesting conversation with PokerStars the other night who seemed very um, in favour of it but needed to see proof of concept. Right. Um, which is hopefully what I'm providing next month. Um, so as far as poker goals, I'd love to see this, you know. And I, I say, and PokerStars going to be so what do you want to go? I don't, I don't fucking know. <laughs> I just want a partner to help me make it happen. Yeah, you know, and then if if it's successful at some point, I'm, I'm maybe I'll make some money out of it. But let's let's do something that that helps um, grow the game and do something that um, 
gets more gets people excited about playing poker again. Um, so if as a personal goal for me, if I could make that happen, yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah. Well, whenever that happens and that takes place, and you and you get some content, let me know. I'll uh, I'll put yeah. it out there for the people. They'll 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 give me feedback. I don't know if the feedback is gonna yeah. be good or gonna be bad, but they're gonna certainly give me some feedback yeah. on it. But I'll, I'll definitely do my part to kind of yeah. draw some awareness to, to what's taking place because I mean we you know we had the GPI shout out to my man Alex Dreyfus and um, I had high hopes for GPI global the Global Poker League or GPL sorry saying I get them confused but you know didn't work out whatever is what it is and uh, people Dude, were right people were right I was wrong. Something about that. Sure, go ahead. Uh, he's your man. I don't know. Uh, no, no. I, don't, I mean, we're we're uh, we, you know we're 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 acquaint. We're acquaint. We're friendly. We chat. You know, once in a while. But like, yeah, yeah. Did you did you really think that format was going to work, dude? I'm a, I'm, an, on, I'm an optimist. Seriously, I'm an optimistic no, no. person. No, 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 no cop out. No cop outs now. Don't you know, right? You know, you call bullshit. I'm calling bullshit, right? I thought it did could you, work. You? How could it possibly work? Well, Ow. listen. I don't play. I don't play tournaments, so I don't really fucking know how a tournament a tournament thing could have worked out. But I just had faith it could work. I don't know, man. I, I it seemed it like at the be. time they had a lot of players involved. Had too, had too many moving parts. Had too many moving parts. Some guys playing online in the studio. Some guys are playing a tournament over here. So I mean, who? How do you follow this? <laughs> I don't. Well, I, I, I was asked. I was asked to be part of a couple of teams, and I said, oh, "I'm sorry. I, I wish you all the best, but I don't think it's going to be." I, I don't believe in the format. You know? To to be fair, I didn't follow it, but I uh, I mean I I hoped it would succeed, but I watched a little bit. It was a little boring. Like I don't I didn't want to watch sit and go. I don't I never watch a sit and go. I don't ever plan to watch a sit and go for the most part. And to me, it just felt like a bunch of sit and goes. Even the the players I I I, I knew players in there. I'm friends with them, but at the same time, it's just like it didn't seem like the players really cared either, and no one necessarily took it that serious. And I think that kind of showed it in, in what happened. And I think that technical setup they had and as you mentioned like one guy's in a studio one guy's in his bed one guy's in the bathroom like it was a little you know a little little weird there were some moments you know there were some moments with jungle man and and, and we had some clips and stuff like that but for the most part yeah didn't 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 work out and now and, now it, he's on to crypto other, now so yeah. the other reason is that uh whoever's tried to do this before including the gpl started up here how can you just introduce a format and decide that we're going to start up here? You need to introduce a format at the very basic, at the, at the very roots of poker mm -hmm. and build it up rather than trying to invest in trying to do something up here and hope and praying for a Hail Mary that people are going to catch on. So start it here, get people to understand the, con the format, the concept, get people to see how exciting it is, how uh, how the team spirit is involved, and then because everyone will want to do be part of a team at some point, and then grow it slowly. You know that way it may take three years to right. get to a point where I think okay now it's successful. Um, and the the one of the reasons that I'm doing this, Joe, is I think uh, poker has become uh, really hard to watch for everybody, and I don't know whether this is. This is going to make it easy to watch poker, but I do know that if we, if the tribal element is successful, and a sponsor can watch their team play regularly, they're going to be more likely to be involved in an event like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? For sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of building up something slowly and not sort of aiming to be like, okay, everyone accept this and, and this is going to be this big thing, yes. especially in poker where we've never really had any sort of team element before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's never been a thing. So, yeah, I think that it takes people to get used to it, kind of seeing it. And you're right, it, it, is, a, it is a couple year project. And I think you sort of need to have that mindset where, okay, it might at the first, we got to figure some things out and whatever, but... This could have some potential down the road, but if it, it might not be for years down the road. You know what? I, I've just been told that um, I'm actually allowed to discuss it with you. Do you want to hear about it? Sure. Um, so I'm going to give you the short version. So I want you to think of um, a tennis tournament. Do you follow tennis at all? 
I follow it a little bit, but I can't say I religiously follow it. So, but you know how they have the brackets? Right. There's this bracket and that bracket. So I want you to envision 16 teams of three players per team. Yeah? Okay. The teams get drawn out at a um, at a drawing party, kind of like what the NBC Heads Up used to do, mm-hmm. a live drawing party. Random draw into each bracket. There's two brackets, yeah? Eight teams and eight teams. The three, the team, the eight teams have single elimination, and they, the three players play heads up matches against the other three players. Yeah, with the captain choosing one person, the other captain choosing another person to play against each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've got to win two out of three matches. You've got to win two out of three your three matches to win your your game. The team has to win two out of three games to proceed to the next round. So you go from from eight to four to two to one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the the top four are in the money. We haven't decided yet. Maybe four and three will play off for the bubble. But along the way, right? Each game, each player is recorded on a ladder of how many matches he wins and loses. By the end of it the MVP will go to the player who's won the most matches. So now we have the tribal element. There's, there's teams going on, mm-hmm. right? And then you're also playing for yourself as well as an, as an added prize. It's very simple. The theatre is in the drawing party. The theatre is in... Because I've trialled this before. This is a, the first proper tournament, but I've trialled it. Where in other teams' events, the the... The team members walk off and you go, oh, okay, I'll come back later. I'm going to have a drink. You don't want to walk off now because you know that your partner's winning or losing hurts you directly, not just your team. Right. There's a lot more camaraderie. There's a lot more team uh, play. So the first event's going to be a, a $5,300 event for the team. Ooh. Well, too much. So well, it seems like it seems like it'd be a lot. Well, it says is the team. So as a team members, do you? It's randomly selected, right? So everyone that registers no. for it. No, 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 no. You make your own team. Oh, okay. Step I thought in. you randomly select. Oh, you get to pick your team. Oh, damn. Okay, that's kind of okay. Dude, you pick your team. Like if you 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 and your two buddies think you know, uh, you know, we're we're really good. I trust how you play. You, you trust how I play. Let's make a team. Let's beat these guys. It's not randomly chosen. Right. What's randomly chosen in, is which bracket your team plays. So it's a it's a similar to a similar sort of idea concept of NBC Heads Up, which we saw was a pretty popular format, a pretty popular show, and and that was something that I think people really enjoyed. It's yeah, that's taking that heads up element and turning it into a teams event, right? Where the the teams will win money, but also the individual is still fighting for his own. You know, you get you you're the MVP player for that uh, tournament. Let's take the next couple of steps if this kicks off, right, and people actually enjoy it, which I hope they do, is that some somewhere down the line, we have a series of four tournaments. And the MVP gets rolled into the next tournament, into the next tournament. After the first tournament, each team gets seeded for the next tournament. It starts to sound a lot more like a, a sport. Right, yeah. How we're doing it, people can can understand, can re- can relate to it. They're the number one number one seeded team. Why? Because they won the last tournament. He's the MVP. He's the number one seeded player in the series. Why? Because he's won the most matches. Mm-hmm. It's kind of black and white to to understand. You don't have to go through some fucking swanky formula. And no, there are it- you know people all over the place trying to get it together. It's in one place. I mean, I think people really love brackets. I think people really love things like that. I I love anything with a bracket personally. I want to watch anything with a bracket personally. I think the idea certainly has some potential too. I'd be curious to see if people, I would say do people enjoy watching Heads Up, but obviously we've seen Heads Up formats be popular in the past. So I do think that you could do something like that that people would enjoy. It's a matter of what they, they watch. Do they know the players? How exactly would the presentation work in terms of them being able to watch it with so many matches going on too? There are definitely some things to, to sort of figure out from the presentation standpoint of that. But if I assume if it 
wasn't done live and it was packaged after that you could edit together a pretty compelling story for uh for, for the tournament and for the matches that take place see like here's the thing right my main focus right now is to get people on board playing it i don't care about filming it now mm -hmm. just playing it i don't care about a tv audience i don't care about a tv audience if if you build it people will come right mm -hmm. <laughs> that line is so famous if we can get people to adopt it and want to be part of the team want to play want to make their own team for the next series and it gains traction the future this is what the future looks like to me yeah where they're playing in a stadium in an isolated fucking room that's got no electronic communication and they're hooked up with heart monitors, blood pressure monitors, and sweat monitors. And there's people outside watching, and, and the games are going on simultaneously. That's, well, I, I don't know where that is in the future, but that's kind of like. That sounds very, uh, something like eSports, which I always would, would wish that com comes to poker in some capacity, for thank sure. Thank you very much. That's, that's, what I, that's what I got it from. I was like, if I can get this right, maybe we can reach a level of eSports. But it's gotta be simple, so that's, you know, I've only been working on this for four years to, to get it right because there's so many things that um, uh, needed to be ironed out. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, but for me, is esports? Why is esports so popular? People fucking filling out stadiums to watch this stuff, to watch people press buttons on a fucking on a little console, right? Um, and why why aren't people watching poker the same? And I figure, well, people have been watching nine people sit around poker table throwing chips in for a long time now we need to do something to, to change it up a little bit you know yeah but i'm not but my my, my whole thing doesn't start at oh we're gonna get this televised you gotta do this i don't know where, where that fucking comes in right at the moment i've got to get people to play it play it yeah people to love it so then next year if this is successful next year crown will say to me we can run four of these, one in each series. We can have a rolling MVP and get people behind it. I think as humans, we love being part of something bigger, greater than us. Mm -hmm, for sure. Whether, it, whether it's a family, a community, a, 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 a suburb, a country, whatever it is, right? a team is a primary element. You know? So as a poker player, if I can still feed my need to play for myself, yet still be part of the team, I've kind of ticked the boxes that um, make me uh, whole as a human. Yeah, and I think as, it's, as a competitor. I think it sounds like a fun idea. I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited to say, I think if players buy in, if the players enjoy it, I think that's that's what will be most important. If, yeah. if you can find people that support the idea and say, all right, this is fun. Like, let's try to make this actually be be a success and work out, then I think it's... Um, and that, and I th that's where it has to start, Joey. It has to start with the players. Right. There's no use in introducing something saying, all right, everyone, here's what we're doing. Okay, what the fuck? I mean, does it work? Like, that's why we're starting with um, with this. And, my, and I, like I said, I'm leading on a lot of personal uh, relationships and, and friendships to make this first one a success. I'm actually, you know, I'm paying for the, for the drawing party. The drawing party will be a, a big show where um, everyone will come along. We'll have cocktails and hors d'oeuvres and whatever and just exactly like, like NBC heads up did they they did a really good job with that mm -hmm. and then the way I look at it is that the strategy of the game will start the night of the drawing party once you know who you who you uh, which team you're playing against and who's going to be in your bracket because you're, you're going Joey you know what Joey I think you should play Harry tomorrow in the, in the <laughs> heads up right? because I think you know we know his game we know your game that'll be a better match right right um Think about the, all the permutations that come about from this. If it works, you can do the Nations Cup, the World Cup in this format, which people have tried to do before, right? Which, yeah. Which is pretty cool. You can do a celebrity version and have one celebrity per team where the celebrities only play each other. <laughs> yeah? You can do another version where um, every match you win, you make money out of it from the start. Whatever it a lot takes. Of like, oh, a lot of possibilities in there, it sounds like. It's a it's an open um, 
page at the moment. Like, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But anyway, so that's... Uh, that's my poker goal, you know. I mean, <laughs> I like how I, I like how excited you are about. It. Listen, I like I like hearing anyone when they get excited about an idea and they believe in an idea. I mean, this is what happened with the with GP like Drivis. I, I had him on the podcast. He talked about the idea to me. He's he like I feel like he's like a, a war leader. He could he could send you through a war. He'd be like a good commander in a war or something like that, Dreyfus. And so I was like, oh, this idea sounds cool. Like I support the idea, but maybe people on the outside didn't think it was a good idea. So. I'm I'm pretty optimistic about a lot of things. I think if you if someone believes in the idea that they do, and and I think it's different with you because you are one of the biggest ambassadors in Australia. I think you've done a lot for poker in Australia, and I think people really like you, so they'll want to support the idea as well too. And I think that goes a long way as well to getting players on board, as if they want to support the idea because you're involved with it too. So I feel like you're, you've got to be a pretty good person to sort of lead the charge on a project like that. I'll have a crack, mate. We'll see. We'll see how we go. You know, like, I'm I'm confident. What's the worst that could happen? You know, what was the no. was you know what's the worst that happens? I don't like. I don't know. What's the yeah, downside? That doesn't work. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't work. work exactly. Yeah. Like the the downside is that it doesn't work, and then you go do something else. Like I mean, it, it, when you think about it, isn't yeah. that big of a downside for them? Like gets, you know, big big deal. So and if it does work out, yeah. it's something that it, it could be something really really cool and really really special for the community. Yeah, I'd like you know that would be a dream come true for me if I could. Do something that that helps poker go to the next level. Yeah, talk to Poker Go. Poker Go might be interested. They're looking for new programming out there, Joe. Just met with them yesterday. Just met with them yesterday. They're looking for new programming out there. They might be ready. I don't know. I'm serious. They. uh, I actually I met with the guy who was was um, in charge. He created the NBC Heads Up. So he's. I don't know. I mean, listen. Yeah, his name's uh, his name's uh, Jamie Jamie Horwitz. Okay. Oh, no, Jamie. Yeah, so he he's the one that created that, and then he went on to ESPN, and then he went on to um, creating shows on ESPN, and then on Fox Sports. I think he was in charge of like Fox Sports uh, programming on there with like some of these debate style talk shows and stuff like that. So they uh, they they brought him in to um, to help out Poker Go and kind of put together a good show. And he seems like he really loves poker, and the NBC Heads Up was one of his favorite things he's ever done. So. Yeah, I don't know. It kind of brought back a lot of cool memories talking to him about that. And uh, I don't know. I just used to really enjoy watching that a lot because you got to see pe- people that you knew facing off heads up and you got to see Ivy and then Helmuth first. Thir- I mean, there's just so many really cool moments, I think, from that show. So I, I have a pretty fond memories of-, of that. And I wish something like that was still around, too. So, Yep. Me, too. I'm excited. So October 15th, that's the first uh, first time it's going to be going on? Yep. Here in Melbourne, the crowd. Is it the... um, I'm, I'm planning to have the whole event sold, sold out before, uh, like a week before or something. So if someone's watching and they want to, and they want where they contact you, or what would be the best way to, to go upon? They can hit me up on Instagram if they want to be, you know, obviously you've got to be in the country at the time to play. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, to be honest, I've actually, I've almost sold out the event anyway. Nice. I've been leaning. I've been leaning hard. And, <laughs> I can uh, tell. Yeah, <laughs> I've got some. You know, I've I've had some good support from friends. So I've, on top of that too, I've been able to uh, um, get a couple of sponsors on board to add some money to the prize pool. That's awesome. That's really cool. You know, like I know, I know poker players are always looking for some extra money. So um, you know, I think if I don't know, I have a, I have a good feeling about it. We'll see. We'll see how we go, Joey. I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, interested to see some of the content from that and see that because I think that will be something to talk about and, and kind of see what people, people think. I'm, I'm curious. Some people watch this and kind of give me their feedback in the comments here. Normally we're live, so I'd be seeing the comments now and people would be giving me in real time feedback and then they would ask questions and stuff like that. So, but I'll have some comments I'll be able to, to, to talk about later and stuff like that from people. So, definitely curious to see. And um, and, and um, let me know what sort of feedback comes back. I, I'm, I'm happy to to hear any, you know, any sort of feedback that's going to help me make it into a better event. Well, I can just put the idea out there on Twitter and you'll get a lot of feedback from people on Twitter. So <laughs> if you want that kind of feedback, I can propose the idea. I feel like when you, if, I feel like if you talk about the idea before it goes down, I think people are going to perceive it a lot differently. Whereas after it actually takes place and people can kind mm-hmm. of maybe see something that happened or see results or something like of that nature, then it's a different yeah. story. But before it happens, you know, people like they're like kind of pessimistic yeah. and they might, I, I feel like, you know, I, I I don't know if it necessarily be. Um, then don't put anything out there, Joey. Just leave it alone. Yeah, I'll kind of uh, I'll wait till it kind of goes down. I mean, people will watch this and they'll hear it too and, and stuff like that as well. But 
Yeah, I'm kind of. Uh, I guess what what do you have planned here coming up for rest of the year poker wise? You have this October fifteenth, and then do you have any tr- plans to travel anywhere um, for any poker at all, or are you 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 I'm, you at, you at Australia? I'm Australia till I'm in Australia for a while. My next big trip will be to um, Macau for the Poker Stars ACOP event, mm-hmm. and then right after that to Vegas for the Bellagio if I've done. That's in December. December. Yeah, December. December. Mm. Well, I'll think my next trip is the part. I'm going to this party poker thing in November. They're doing something oh. down at the new the new casino oh, I down there. I wanted to go that so bad. I, oh, man. That, if, if only it wasn't like three days away traveling for me. Yeah, that yeah. would be incredibly far to go from Bahamas to uh, the Macau. For like, <laughs> for like five days. It's a long time. Yeah, that uh, I don't know that that new place down there, the Bahama or something, looks pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty something. It looks brand new. It's a brand new casino in the Bahamas. It's got to be pretty sick. So, I'm uh, I mean, I'm ex- I'm excited. If you like me, I'm I'm so over um, uh, what's it called? The one on Paradise Island. Um, oh, uh, Atlantis. Oh, I haven't been back for years, but I couldn't go back there anyway. It's just like I'm done with that place. You be- you've been there so, too often. Too often, and it's just—it's had better years a long time ago, you know. Like, and uh, so this new place is exciting. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see the uh, the results of what people's feedback is after they've had the event there. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm very curious as well too because it just like it seems like it's Atlantis, but they rebuilt Atlantis and they made this new place like it's Atlantis, but all 2018 sort of versions. But I could kind of oh, see. I- is it the same sort of? Uh, does it look the same? Does it? I mean, to me, from the photos I've seen, it's not. I don't think it's the same exact sort of. Um, I don't think it's the same exact. And I'll probably input a, a photo in here for people that are watching this back. But I don't think it's exactly the same sort of like monstrosity. But it is pretty uh, fucking big, I believe. Yeah, oh, it's wow. pre- It looks pretty similar. Yes, yes, it looks pretty similar. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy how similar it looks. So does not doesn't quite have that little uh, the the thing that connected it across the top. But in terms of two big towers, then a bunch of other small towers, and then like the little pool setting looks like it's on a beach, and then an actual beach there too. So now you're thinking about now you're thinking more about going, huh? <laughs> I'd love, it was, only if it was a little bit closer. Even if there was something else on at the time, but that means I'd have to come back, then go back for the five diamond and. Uh, that's a little that's a little to, to, that's a little too, too much here what uh i guess a question i like to ask people what kind of poker advice a piece of poker advice you have you'd give to people out there that are trying to bank it out there in poker that want to become a professional or that want to potentially get better and then move up stakes from what they're playing i mean always to be honest it always comes down to bankroll management doesn't it i mean you, you can sure. never talk enough about bankroll because there's no use talking strategy or you know, poker shit. That's all out there. The people that are way smarter than me who have worked this shit out. But you know what? Money management 101. That's no matter how good you are. If you don't have that, you're just wasting your time. Mm-hmm. You think you know you're going to be in this endless loop of doing the same shit all over, you know, over and over again, and expecting a different result, which is, as we know, is the pure definition of insanity, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and you know. I was there, you were there, we all go through it. It's when you decide to get off that treadmill and you know jump onto a different path that you suddenly see everything in your life start working in your favor. Yeah. Because you know we win, we do something stupid, we lose, we go broke, we start again, we win, you know. So manage your bankroll. That's as simple as that. You know? um, I think that's picking, I think that's good pick stuff. And choose, pick and choose where you're going to play, who you're going to play against, for how much you're going to play. Don't go out and party too much. <laughs> <laughs> Do not mix partying and party playing poker. We used to see that way more back in the day. Now, now, nowadays, I, I guess people probably still do that. I just don't hear about them doing that. But I know some guys that that are pretty hard partiers still. So they're they're not as common as as back in the day now. Yeah, people back. They, they still they still exist. I think back in the day everyone was doing the same thing. Like everyone was just partying. Like those years between two thousand six and two thousand and ten, they were ridiculous what was going on. What's the what's the craziest story that, that you can remember that took place for you 
about that time. Oh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it's probably a good thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, nothing, nothing, I just remember like everyone was just everyone was it's just constant party mode, and we would show up to a tournament and play, would show up to a cash game and play. But the whole the whole poker world as we knew it was just there was so much money floating around. You know, uh, everyone was just partying all the time, like ridiculous amounts of money being spent in clubs and you know people ordering champagne uh just yeah it was crazy times joe i think i said us the young the kids today do live it up a little bit but um like i said they're a lot more professional than what we used to be back in the day yeah uh, they uh they seem to have a lot more i don't want to use the word common sense but more knowledge of how you know an understanding of how to uh, be professional in the game of poker mm-hmm. to to make a living out of it properly. It was back in the day, you just it was so easy to make money in poker. You just you didn't care how much you spent. Yeah. Now, now you're working, fighting tooth and nail, right? I mean, you know, you you I, I presume that you make most of your money uh, playing poker. Pretty much, Is yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty much accurate? most of my uh, most of my last ten or 11, 12 years, yeah. So you know when you would have seen a big change in you, how easy it was to make money, say ten years ago, as opposed to the last few years, right? Yeah, I just think, I think like overall the the bum hunting uh, tactics have gotten a lot stronger. There's a lot more guys who just strictly bum hunt. The amount of really fun players who are just kind of giving money away. Those guys still exist, but it's not to the extent. And then the other regulars that you play with against those players are are better too. And then also rake is a lot higher. You have to pay winnings to, percentage of your winnings to people that get you on sites. And there's all these other elements that have kind of taken over now. And, and yeah, I mean, it's just it's a different challenge now in terms of making money at poker and finding games and getting mm. paid and avoiding rake, avoiding bots, avoiding getting scammed. And there's all these other things that you have to overcome, whereas you didn't really have to overcome those things 10 years ago those those things weren't weren't as prevalent and if they were the bad players were just abundant where you could overcome that pretty easily yeah and the the reality is it's, it's not going to get any easier i don't think i don't think so online no i think it's uh <laughs> kind of it's kind of moving to a point where can you find the best site can you potentially get in a, a private game can you get in the right club i think that's where the skills going and it's not really you know, it, the skill is like, how good are you actually at poker in terms of being really good or competing against the best players? I think that's sort of going by the wayside at online, but that's still going to be there at live poker. So, and, and tournaments and high stakes tournaments. So, and tournaments online, I think too, but cash games online, it's uh, it's changing, mm. changing quickly. You don't, you don't play tournaments online, do you? No, I have probably played, I've probably played less than 20 tournaments in my entire life online. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was going to ask you: uh, Are the tournament numbers online still strong, or are they going down as well? It's a good question. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually sure about that. I don't know. Um, I haven't really paid any, any attention to the Poker Stars tournament numbers or Party Poker tournament numbers or anything like that. So yeah, I, I'm not actually sure about that. Hmm. No. Okay. Be curious too, though. I might have to ask. I'll ask some of the tournament players and kind of see what they think. See so what the numbers are like on in tournaments, because I. I would presume that um, their overall their overall numbers are down, which would suggest their tournament numbers are down as well. But I don't know. Yeah, you you, you think so, but I mean, maybe maybe not. I feel like Stars is putting a lot of promotional money into tournaments and into the all their little formats that they have going on there with spin and goes and stuff like that. And I, I think we can count those tournaments probably too. But it's a good question. I'm actually going to ask and kind of figure out and, and find out what the numbers are because I'm I'm curious that myself. I'm gonna write that down here. I'm gonna message one of the guys at Stars and see what they say. So, but yeah, any any other right. any other things you want to add, Joe? Anything else you wanna you wanna add here? No, man. I'm. Uh, it's been good. It's been good. I'm ready to go. I've got uh, someone to see. So, um, it's been nice chatting to you. Finally, get to meet you, and uh, I, I love the work that you do. Keep it up. I know you, you work with passion, and uh, I respect you for that. And, uh, Thank you. Do it. You love the game of PLO, but I, I think you have a. Um, a love for poker that you want to see the right things being done so you have my support Joe 
Much love, Joe. I appreciate you uh, coming on. I think um, hopefully people enjoy out there. And, and yeah, we'll be following along with how things go with the uh, with your with your format idea, man. I I'm, I'm hope it works out for you, man. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much. All right, Stay man. Well. Take care. Peace out. Peace. Everybody out there watching at a later date. Much love, everybody. See you guys later. Take care.